we're gonna get with the panel. And you're basically going to talk about how you got started with agriculture, farming, and just basically share some basics on what you do, how you grow, where you grow, your marketing channels, if you wanna get into that, you can also get into that. Um, management structure, types of practice, maybe organic, regenerative, and also consider sharing any other relative farm, anything build is relative. And just basically, why are you here today? What's your mission? I know, the lot. You don't have to cover all of it, but you do need to talk about some of it. How's everybody doing? Hey. Okay, I'm, I'm Kendrick Ransom, uh, Edgecombe County, Pine Tops. I'm 27 years old. I'm the former at Gordon Organic Farm. We have an organic farm. Um, what else? <laughs> so we do a lot. We have an agriculture athlete camp as well, where we bring the kids from the community. Uh, we bring them to the farm. Um, everybody in our area they want to be professional athletes. We have several uh, NFL players, NBA players that have made it. So a lot of our, um, a lot of our community, they, they want to be professional athletes. So we bring them all to the forum. We have an agriculture athlete camp where we teach them proper stretching, proper breathing uh, techniques. We teach them health and nutrition. Um, we teach them farm chores, garden <laughs> chores. We show them how to feed the pigs, you know, different things like that. Um, very important, you know, really watching them as they, as they endure their, um, their lessons and, and learn them and getting back to the land, you know. So um, that's very important to me. It's very important to our community. <laughs> now, what area did you say? Where are, Where you, are you from? Yes. I'm from Edgecombe County. Where? Pine Tops. Edgecombe County is East. Yes, ma'am. North Carolina. North Carolina. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, it's like, it's like four hours east, like four and a half hours. It took me like five and a half hours to get here from the two daughters. So, so we had to stop and things like that. Well, you still local. <laughs> Who's going to go next? Hi, um, I'm Sunil, and uh, I'm humbled to be up here with all you folks, um, and amongst all you folks. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I've been farming for uh, over 15 years, um, but I've been in Asheville for about seven years now. And uh, I started a farm called Patchwork Urban Farms. Um, I got into farming just because food such a big deal in my life, and it was mostly about eating it and cooking it up until I kind of got exposed to growing it, um, and then I was on this mission to really figure out how that's done, and then in the process learn about the state of food and farming in the world, and, and uh, one of those states is what Leo was talking about today. and. Um, the farm is, uh, it's an LLC, so it's a for-profit farm, but um, all along the way we've tried to create uh, internal initiatives to, um, to affect food access issues, um, mainly in Asheville. Um, so it's a multi-plot farm, they have patches all around town. Um, one of the patches used to be in the south side, I just kind of um, vacated farming over there for various reasons. And um, in our first season, like our first initiative was, oh, it's a food desert, let's put up a roadside stand. And realizing like that wasn't the, the first step. Um, it was more about creating relationship and creating trust and all those types of things that, you know, make, make something like having fresh food available in a place that it's not something that's actually valuable to folks, or even not valuable, I might even say it's not even needed. And so that was like lesson one in year one of like trying to affect food access issues. And then over the years, we've just done lots of collaborative work with um, uh, trying to collaborate with Ujima Freedom Market, which was a mobile market, uh, worker-owned cooperative um, rooted in the black community of Asheville. And, um, and then uh, 
this year, and there's other things that would take too long to describe, but um, all the time we're trying these things. But this year we have a new kind of initiative. Um, Kate, who is um, someone who I can't see if she's here right now, uh, in the back, <laughs> uh, uh, who is growing uh, food for donation, um, and she's uh, part of the patchwork network of patches, but she's um, seeking funding to grow uh, part-time to um, supply food, but to a few different organizations in town, one of them being Southside Rising. I'm sorry, this is getting really long. Um, <laughs> and, and she's, uh, the important thing she's doing, though, is she's making collaborative relationships happen, which is that step one that was supposed to happen in our, in our year one, and so it's super exciting. Um, but you can ask more questions about it all. And we're going to jump down here to Felicia real quick. You can keep the mic. She has the mic. No, it's whatever you feel comfortable with, honey. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Felicia Bell, from, and I, I have notes because I'll forget stuff. So, <laughs> Felicia Bell, uh, RDNS Farm, Brandon, Mississippi. Uh, one of those questions was just how I got started in farming. So, I was born into farming. Uh, so my grandfather is who taught me the outdoor work. My grandmother taught me the indoor, the cooking, the good eating and stuff. And so one of the things I always say and, and let people know that I was born on chemical free land. We never use chemicals. My children, sons are sixth generation and we still don't. Um, and I really, really push that because there's some farms you know, don't say that, they're not proud of that. I'm very, very proud of that. And when I said going into far farming, I'll give a little part of my age, it was early 70s. Uh, and so um, that's, that's what it was about. Now, one of the things I noticed as a, just a little child that wasn't anything chaotic, everything worked together. And now, you know, being grown, I call that symbiotic relationship. Um, that's how our farm has been, and that's how it is now. Um, one of the things I can just give you brief what we grow and raise, um, Gulf Coast native sheep, that's a heritage breed sheep, um, known in, as you heard, Gulf Coast, who was known on the coast. Um, chickens, rabbits, ducks, the vegetables is just strictly homestead. We really don't push it out to the public. Um, the sheep, the lamb is what we do commercially. And then this year we added bees and cut flowers. Um, again, I did say I'm from Central Mississippi. We direct market, online sales and stuff. And then the lady brought my three sons and all that stuff. <laughs> not in a negative connotation. I believe in you, you know, our children um, are here to work. Like, like I said, I was born into it. So we weren't, I wasn't told to work. You just did that because you were part of the family. That's how my sons know. They were just born into it and they're part of it. But I can tell you that I, my sons, my older son has businesses. Um, so they're not just laborers. I never want to raise just laborers. They're gonna be the next economic move um, in our society. So I'm very proud of that, but they had to learn it somewhere. And that's how they became laborers and stuff. Um, one of the young men here, DJ, that just got up earlier, he uh, helped on the farm as well. He's from Oklahoma City, uh, but come to Mississippi on the food court. And I was on the food court for Mississippi at the time. So I've had help and I'm grateful and I just so happen to have male help. So I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, um, and I always have been in a cooperative manner and stuff. So, um, and we can move on and then if you want me to answer the last question. I would love for you to keep going. Oh, <laughs> yeah. um, the type of practices, again, is traditional, ancestral. Um, I, as, when Leah did that, that, that just moved my heart to be able to see Mississippi and Alabama uh, just represented, because we are always known as just negative, negative, negative. Uh, but a lot comes from the South. <laughs> and, and the food stuff comes from the South. And so I was just so proud to see that. But our culture for us on our farm is the traditional way. Uh, and I'm very proud of that. And I'm always willing and able to teach people that. Because uh, my grandfather just wanted it to be shared. That was his thing. He gave service. And that's what I'm here to do is to give service. And so 
Uh, the last thing I'll say with my, I, I have to give a plug for the boys that are not here, because uh, being is still, we have to make you know, the money and stuff. So uh, my oldest son is 27. Uh, he does, his business is called Farmhand Carrier. Uh, you can find him on, you know, on the social media platforms and stuff. But he does anything that you don't want to do, and that's his tagline. <laughs> <laughs> he does all farm repair infrastructure, anything that uh, fencing and barns and anything like that, he repair and, and fix those water lines, gas lines, different things like that, because on the farm floor is in the south. I can't speak for North Carolina, but in our area, you don't have to have the permits and license to do water lines and the gas lines when it comes to farming. Now, you do have to do it when you're doing a residential or commercial building. Uh, he also do farm city, and the last thing I would say, he do travel out of state. <laughs> <laughs>
I've been growing food, starting mushrooms and all these herbs and things like that. In 2015, I started Microsymbiotics. It's a mushroom research and education company, business. Um, I'm not really a good businessman, but I like to teach, so that's what I do. I just research, I go out in the woods, I find interesting organisms, I study them, and then I make that research available to people through classes that I teach. Um, so I'm really working on continuation of healing myself um, so that I can be a better person, be a better man for those around me, and be a better man for the community that I participate in. And I'm honored to be up here, and uh, I'd love to speak with you all more and hope to uh, get to know a little bit more about y'all and hope that you can learn a little bit more from me. Southern accent or country accent, just hold out the Y and say Ryan, 
Get, that makes sense? Yeah. That makes sense? Okay. Now, I just want to do a little training exercise. Just bear with me. Just bear with me a little bit. All right. On the count of three, I'm going to practice my name. That sound cool? R-H-Y-N-E. All right. Now, on the count of three, two, one, we're going to try that out. Okay, sound good? All right. Three, two, one. to agriculture, being pig farming. Uh, so I actually used to farm both in Texas and North Carolina, uh, Waco, Texas, and Eflin, North Carolina. Oh, we got Waco? Yeah. Hey! <laughs> Ooh, Waco, Waco, Texas. There are a lot of crazy people there. Uh, good vibes, though. Definitely good vibes. Awesome people. Um, yeah, so most people know me for uh, my advocacy work in niche pork production. Uh, so I actually used to farm out free-ranging uh, pigs, and it was really hard and difficult. Uh, I hated pigs, raising them outdoors, because they were like, let's, let's get word, annoying, obnoxious, let's see, they destroy everything. Your fencing is literally like, like a twig, they just go, like that. I remember the biggest story was um, at a sow, and uh, her name was Louise. Uh, she was like 600 pounds, and uh, she actually was breaking out of enclosures after enclosure after enclosure. And so uh, the farm crew was like, hey, Ryan, can you come back and, and tame Louise? I'm like, okay, it's my day off, but farmers don't have days off. So, okay, all right, I'll come back. Um, and I ended up going back, and after feeling assured that I had captured her, Put her in plenty of pasture, plenty of space. You know, the only thing between me and her was a chain link fence gate. I felt, I felt like everything was gonna be okay, right? I turn around and like seconds later, she literally lifts it up from the hinges and skyrockets it into the air. I'm not. Sometimes I'm like, I think it was 20 feet. She probably like flew it up 20 feet. Then I'm like, okay, maybe six. I don't know. Ten. Ten's a good number. Um. And just seeing that, I felt completely hopeless in pig farming. I was like, I'm done. I'm tired of this. Pigs are stupid. I hate pigs. I hate pigs. I hate pigs. Um, and then I just felt the inspiration and in really seeing that I had this all wrong. I put the emphasis on the pig as a problem. And I realized, well, maybe I'm the problem, right? And so then that kind of led me down this journey of humility and understanding and patience uh, that really gave me an appreciation for pigs. So then I ended up appreciating pigs so much I ended up becoming pork rind. So you can imagine, right? How could that happen? Um, but I used to do work with the National Pork Board, uh, Pork Checkoff, um, also thinking about how uh, in North Carolina and abroad, uh, helping and advocating for um, niche producers who don't really have much of a voice when it comes to commercial operations and really being able to allow people to know that uh, we exist, we're out there, we got problems, we need help with those problems, give us money, stuff like that. Um, so things I'm doing currently, uh, full time, I work as a pit master, so I smoke meat all day. Uh, I literally came from work in Greensboro, that was a drive, um, and let's see. Headmaster, full time, got that down, check. All right, awesome. Um, other job is I'm a contract worker for Carolina Creative Works, uh, so I'm their agricultural educator. Uh, so working with them on their webinars as well as uh, their ag summits, which are full day long ag programming. Um, and then another crown jewel for me is uh, I go overseas every year uh, to Uganda and Tanzania. Sorry, Tanzania. Um, and while there, I actually train and educate uh, rural farmers and villagers on better practices for agricultural production 
primarily in livestock and more specifically with pigs. Um, so I always talk about farming is business over there and from that I ended up bringing that appreciation of economics and business with agriculture. I think with uh, our general farming populace, uh, we love the land, we're very passionate about being part of the community, uh, but when it comes to business, like, low key, we really suck at that. Um, and it's okay. And I think there's room for improvement, and so I felt like that was kind of my second wave of admission, is being able to really see how can we focus more on business aspect, farming. Um, I actually went to uh, the Moses Conference, uh, Midwest Organic Conference, uh, and I had a mentee that was over there, and so I stayed with him, and actually we went over his farm budget. It was terrible. Like, it, like, like I thought it was bad. I was like, okay, you know, he's, he's starting out. Like, he had, like, barely anything now. He had what he was doing. I think record keeping, any of that, right? That sounds like some of y'all's story, right? Raise your hand if that sounds like your story. Oh, we got a couple of hands. Oh, honest hands. Thank you for your honesty. I appreciate that. Um, and so, just kind of seeing how he's not alone in that. Uh, I feel like sometimes we isolate ourselves in this farming uh, community. And so being able to create uh, honesty, transparency, vulnerability in conversations has been something that uh, I've been feeling led to kind of do within the system. Other than that, I'm going to shut up, otherwise I'll talk for like another 20 minutes. Uh, but I appreciate y'all being here. Thanks. Y'all heard a lot from me, so I'll be brief. I just, um, two things. One is, I have like a super passionate love affair with the earth, and it's really cool to be up here with y'all who also do. I remember when I was young, 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 like five, six years old, my sister and I started the junior college's kids club because we were gonna save the planet. You know, like pick up trash, stop the loggers, stop the sports hunters. I have a more nuanced perspective. Anyway, all the things. And um, something that was heartbreaking for me is when I realized that um, I just assumed it was so obvious that you wouldn't want to trash your mother, that once everybody knew, right, like the rainforest was being destroyed and all that, they would just stop their behaviors. And uh, that wasn't the case. In fact, I mentioned getting beat up. I got beat up a lot, because I went around in my elementary school and like, took everyone's rainforest hardwood pencils and replaced them with recycled pencils, you know, I didn't like that. All the things. So it's all that to say, um, it's, profound to me uh, that we have a community here of black and brown folks who have a reverence uh, for the earth. Um, that's personally what keeps me going. I don't think she would let me out of that contract. And fitting that into this economic system, fitting that into the white man's legal system is tricky. So for us, that looks like you know the land is owned by a co-op, a housing co-op that's like a one member, one vote structure. It took us three years to figure out that legal structure because we wanted to put a rights of nature clause into it, meaning that like in New Zealand, like amongst the Ojibwe with their rice, that nature would actually have veto power over the decisions of the collective. The lawyers have no idea what to do with that, but we figured it out. You know, We also wanted to make sure that there was a shared sovereignty with Mohican Nation, which is another legal challenge. Like New York State doesn't recognize cultural respect easements or shared sovereignty, so we had to fight the state. Da, 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 da. So that's our like legal structure, but then the nonprofit organization um, is like a member tenant of the co-op. And we use sliding scale fee structure for everything that we sell from food to consulting so that like our folks can access it for the right price. Um, and people who have resources like Harvard University can go ahead and pay $10,000 for you know a two day consult or whatever. So that's how we you know, kind of Robin Hood our situation so that, that we make it out in the black but don't exclude folks from the things that they need. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>
All right, yes. So that is actually our panel this evening. So what I would like to do now is to begin our q and So I will have a mic and I'll be able to pass around the mic. Also, it's gonna have someone else on mic, so I don't know where Sarah went. So we'll have one other person passing around mics. And if you have any questions, you can also come down to the mic that's located on this side or either on this side of the room to ask a question. So whatever feels comfortable for you, okay? Is there anyone in the audience who would like to begin our Q&A for? Oh, great. Yes. My name is Rebecca Parker, and I'm the Director of Student Affairs here at Brown my daughter and I, she had to leave early. We live in Columbia, South Carolina. She has a t-shirt uh, that says Pinehurst Farmers Market. And I wanted to personally thank Leah for sponsoring us to come here. And I want to let you know that we came and we brought a crew of farmers. And if they would stand up, please to let them know that they also received <laughs> members might prefer if it was after church on a Sunday at the church they all go to. But you wouldn't know that unless there's that conversation. If the barrier is cost, even with the 30% or perceived cost, um, I know in the north we have some programs like Double Bucks and WIC and other ways that you can get government subsidies to make the dollar go further. And so having some programs like that, so the farmers still getting paid, I think is really important. If the barrier is relationships of trust, uh, we found good success with hiring youth to run the gardens or run the markets, and then they tend to bring their families and communities along with them. But I think, again, there's probably a million right answers, but it will depend on what the actual barrier is, which involves conversation, or you know, maybe you have a community meal and you ask people questions about what you would take. Yeah, I was gonna say, you can never ever fathom 
factor out community engagement. It's, it's, it's something that is non-negotiable, right? You cannot tell the community what it needs. You have to allow the community to be its own heartbeat. And so that's the key component that a lot of times is missing in any um, volunteering effort or any nonprofit effort is that sometimes we go into a thing thinking, okay, we know that this is gonna be great for you, right? And people are like, oh, me. Okay, and it's really important. And so I think um, all of those things are amazing and I understand exactly what you're talking about as far as marketing, you guys are putting your hard work in. You have to have people's input. You have to ask them what it is that they need. What do they need to feel healthy as a community? Um, what are those things, a lot of times, sometimes barriers are just people don't cook the same. So we assume that we're gonna give these people these sweet potatoes, but most people sometimes, depending on the population where you are, don't necessarily cook like that anymore. So having those, are, again, having that feedback to say, okay, hey, these are some of the things we're offering. We would love to know, what do you feel you need? What are we missing? How can we come as a collective? Because right now, it seems as if, just based off what you're saying, there's this kind of a one-sided story. There's no single-sided story. I think we need to remind people that farming and eating local organic foods is super sexy. <laughs> uh, people tend to uh, not know how amazing it is to eat from the land and eat locally. And I found that like um, hosting events and having live music around farmers markets and things of that nature is really beneficial. Um, but like. For the crowds that we're trying to encourage to be a part of it, when I go to a farmer's market and it's like some, like let's just wrap our arms around and dance around a circle type thing, like I don't remember what it's called, the little hay dances that they do at the farm, or the hoedown, whatever. <laughs> like all that stuff, like that doesn't make me want to go to the farmer's market. Right? That doesn't make me want to come to the ad conferences. I'll just sitting in the back, like, all right, that's like, it's cool, we all can do your thing. But like, I really, I went to this, uh, Permaculture Action Day at this um, woman's home outside Atlanta a couple years ago. And it was amazing, and they had uh, rap performances and like other young black artists, and it brought out a lot of young black children and and diverse crowd, and uh, it was amazing, and it got a lot of people to see a reality that they wouldn't usually see and expose them to things that they wouldn't usually see. To see. And we had the opportunity to show them how cool it is, you know. Um, it's part of my whole get up. I don't walk around in farmer's clothes usually unless I'm in the, in the garden. I walk around in urban streetwear and I represent the culture that I come from and I speak to them in the, in the way that they will hear me and I show them that this is cool, you know. I have like little pictures of me like weighing out little mushrooms on a scale or whatever. And, you know, just like, this is cool. I can sell this for like $800 a pound but I'm not gonna get arrested, you know. So it's like really cool. Yeah, just, just keep going. They'll, they'll catch on eventually. 
Only thing I was gonna add is the cooking demos. So versus your daughter doing all the cooking, most of our society now don't know how to cook. And so they're intimidated by that. So if it could be a shared experience and she can teach them how to pick and then come to the table with it being able to cook. So just a suggestion, but that's relationship building. But around food is how we bring people together.
So being a person, being an ally, being protective of the space and allowing people to be able to express their truth, being open and honest and reflective and being able to understand that it's not an attack against you, it's people expressing themselves and expressing how they see the world and how they interact with the world, which may be contrary to how you may interact with the world. Okay. So if that is a key component and that's something you really want to do, those are some Little, just a little tidbits to help you be able to start navigating that terrain um, and being in solidarity in that way. I mean, I don't feel like there's a ton more to add, but you did ask me the question. Um, so I would say, first of all, that it's important to recognize that not all, all of our oppressions and stories are the same. I definitely have been guilty of that kumbaya, like we're all hurt by the white man, so let's just pretend we're all on, on the same team. And the colonial project of div divide and distract has been quite effective. You look at the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, for example, 1800s was an interracial union of millions of tenants who banded together to protest the poor working conditions that they were experiencing. And that was so threatening to the ruling class that they codified um, you know, across the South, racial boundaries in a new way by, for example, punishing uh, black and brown folks who protested uh, more harshly than white folks and trying to make poor white folks think they were more allied to rich white folks than they were to their working class brethren. Sound like anything familiar from, right? And so I think that we have to really challenge that. I believe very strongly in interracial organizing, but it needs to be rooted in a deep understanding of the differences of the ways we've been oppressed. Um, the Three Pillars of White, white Supremacy is a really good article to read if, if that's new to you. Um, but, and I think it's mutual. Like I think black folks have a lot to learn about how we wield secular privilege. I think indigenous folks have a lot to learn about anti-blackness, right? I think we all, black indigenous folks have a lot to learn about language oppression and migrant oppression. And so I think there's some mutuality, but every community has different needs and we made a freaking list, right? And many communities have made a list. So it's like, listen and, and lean in and be willing to show solidarity first before receiving solidarity. Um, it's sort of the literal and metaphorical taking off our shoes. Uh, a little bit to add to that question, um, but kind of on the flip side, um, as everyone is pretty much, I think, familiar with the ice raids that happened in Mississippi last year, um, I, that hit close to home for me um, because I've worked with many immigrants over the past several years, but um, I had some friends that were deported. And so uh, it's, it's hard to see that. It's hard to see that happen. It's hard to see just all that. Um, but uh, my question is this, because in the work that I've been trying to help support in my little bit of free time, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, was, I drove, uh, left my house at 10 o'clock at night, didn't get back till about 2, like 2 a.m. in the morning, uh, because most of the immigrants were actually, were legal immigrants, and so they were releasing them at random times from the jail in uh, the penitentiary in Monroe, Louisiana. So we've been, some. Uh, there's been a group of volunteers driving from the Jackson area to Monroe to pick them up and then take them back to Forest, Mississippi, and Canton, Mississippi, uh, where they're from. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's pretty funny because I don't speak fluent, fluent Spanish. And so they, uh, so it's small talk and getting to build those relationships. So in talking about that, how do we as, and this is for anyone in any ideas that you have, but um, how do we as um, black people build, help build those relationships with, um, with immigrants that are working on these farms and working in these industries in agriculture that, you know, and you talked about it earlier, Leah, that, I mean, that they're being oppressed, that it really is sharecropping and, and, and just, it's just different, it's just it's different, it's a brown people. Versus black, now it's brown people, it's still sharecropping. It's still demonizing and it's still uh, degrading to them. So how do we invite them in the work that we're doing, invite them to our farms and try to communicate and build up and so we, we build solidarity and maybe cooperative or something. But what are your ideas, how do we, bring that together in that solidarity 
uh, despite the language barrier and, of course, the uh, cultural uh, the differences uh, and the trauma differences as well. I'll say one thing real quick, which is that we started doing Spanish first and interpreted programs a couple years ago. Um, they always fill up. So people are, and Miss Lydia, uh, who's from Chile, she had said at the program that she had been in the United States for 30 years, and it was the first time that anybody who wasn't from her immediate community invited her into their home, and the first time that there was a farming program that she could understand, that she was invited to. So like that tells you a lot, right? And so like everything, it is relationship building, but how can we start to build relationships if we're not willing to do language justice, if we're not willing to make sure that spaces are accessible? And then from there, you know, humans are humans. We want to connect, we want to work, and it evolves, it arises, um, the ways that we can be in solidarity with each other. My name is Roy Harris, and I am the unofficial line of the South Side, which you're sitting in right now. Uh, if you have not been welcomed to my neighborhood, welcome. Woo! I heard that y'all were coming, but I wasn't sure who you were. <laughs> now I know. So yesterday morning, I got out and I walked around the neighborhood. And as of any line would be, I marked this territory for you. And to mark this territory, I circled it. And at some point, I came where I could see the iconic Biltmore House. And I'm like, wow. And I kept on walking all the way back downtown. So, walking through the neighborhood, you know, it's, it's strange. 52 years ago, about this time, I stood on the edge of my father's one eight acre plot of garden, handed him that pitchfork and says, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm out of here, I'm headed to school, North Carolina a &T to become an engineer. Thank you, Brian. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Proceeded to work in engineering for 42 years. Who would have ever thought that I would be right back <laughs> on the edge of a garden, inviting black folks, all kinds of folks of all kinds of culture back into the neighborhood and says, thank you for coming and come again. Thank you. Uh, greetings. Um, more life, more strength. Um, when you uh, spoke about our ancestors uh, braiding the seeds into the hair, you know? I want to ask everybody on uh, the panel a question. Um, I'm a farmer as well, and I have a seed saver, so I want to know, <coughs> excuse me, um, how important is uh, seed saving to everyone on the panel, and how important is uh, maintaining the ancestor seed lines to the panel? Very important. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, I save seeds, and it's very, very crucial because so many seeds are contaminated. Yes. And so if you, you're able to get a lineage, you need to keep that lineage and learn how to save seeds. See, that's the misnomer. Most people think you only save seeds one way, and it's the variety type. So please, please learn how to save your seeds. You don't want to get, you know, 100-year-old seeds lineage, and then you, you store them incorrectly. So it's very, very important to save seeds and, and be grateful for them. You know, anyone that give you seeds and stuff and share their family lineage with you through those seeds, please, please be grateful for them because we're, we're losing that. Um, yes, I just want to say what she said, okay? Um, I have, I consider it a privilege to travel to Africa. And when I was living in Africa, I had the privilege of saving this lovely seed called Ayoyo, and it's in the Molokia family. And it has been with me, and we continue to plant it every year and preserve it. And the reason, and this is something that like follows me no matter where I go. We're, my family are always looking for seeds and looking for the story around the seed. 
Um, it is something that I feel like the elders have kind of almost a little seed they planted in my mind, right? That just continues to grow. Um, what I have learned um, from my years abroad is that a lot of traditional people were saving their seed and have and were convinced to give up those seeds for and to buy into you know these seeds that's on the market. And what ended up happening is over time they realized that they like you know one two three seasons maybe and they were no longer getting the cultivation off of that seed like they would their indigenous ones. And so it was a manipulation. And now they're trying to return back to that because they realize that these seeds have, are destroying their land. And the chemicals that's attached to it, that's, it's also destroying their land. So you actually speak to something that's really passionate to my heart. And I've been wanting to go on what I call like a seed voyage around the world because I want to be the one that tell, continues to tell the stories for people who can now that don't have access to tell their story. So I wanna use my voice in a powerful way for someone that seems far away from me, but is my brother and my sister and interconnected to my story as well. Uh, Noah, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> Can you speak to just Mama Ira doing the work? Cause she's located, you know, where people really, they can reach her. And so do you mind sharing what she's doing? Peace y'all, uh, my name is Noah McDonald. Uh, um, I was working at an organization uh, called Saffron Southeastern African American Farmers Organic Network. And um, I had the beautiful opportunity of um, doing a workshop at uh, Bug, the Bug Conference, uh, Black Farms and Urban Growers, with uh, Ms. Ira Wallace. Um, she is currently based in Virginia, in Mineral Virginia, with uh, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. And she, for decades, has been holding down the seed varieties of the Southeast especially the land race seed varieties in the Southeast and um, varieties of seeds that are attached to particular families in particular counties of certain states. Because that's how deep these <coughs> seed lineages go, they follow families. Um, and yeah, she's amazing and I encourage everybody to support um, Southern Exposure and uh, she also has some books out, um, Gardening in the Southeast, I believe, and a couple other ones. But yeah, that's what I say about my mother. Yes, Mama Ira is amazing, and she is definitely looking for people who have stories and have seeds. I've been in discussion with her for the last couple of years, so if you have communities of connection, please reach out. Can I also add, oh, yeah. is this on? Push it. Push it. Hi, okay. Um, when you asked that question, I thought about identity. Um, and so whenever I go to Uganda, um, or even when I used to go to Costa Rica and Jamaica, um, I would see how they love and they desire to emulate the things that we have. So industrialization, uh, I know, um, I talked to a lot of pig farmers there, and they're like, oh yeah, we, we heard about Smithfield, and, and yeah, we want to we we be at that scale, that's the wow. scale that we want. And I'm like, oh no, that's not right. Yeah. Um, and so seeing how it's not just with livestock, but it's with um, agronomy as well, um, I, I see how when you're exchanging for someone else's identity, um, you lose your own. Yeah. Uh, and so when you're trying to kind of going back and searching for, what is my identity? What, 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 where are my seeds at? 
You know, you lose that part of culture, and it's a part of you that's uh, hard to obtain once lost. Um, I know that from my own uh, family lineage, uh, on my father's side, there's um, a lot of information about uh, why I'm artistic, why I'm uh, very creative, that uh, stems from my father's line um, that I have no knowledge or information about, um, and because I don't, I don't have that ability to connect, right? Uh, and so that's a part of my identity that's still there, yet still ambiguous, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, so yeah, I think about that as being identity, and I think with everyone who is here, uh, you all have a particular identity. Um, it's not about emulating someone else. It's not about emulating a different culture, but embrace the ones that, uh, that, that you exist in. Embrace the one that you were born into. Um, I got a good farmer friend, um, John Jackson of Comfort Farms, um, he is a veteran uh, army ranger, and in conversation with him, he told me, you know, like, a lot of people are growing things that aren't even in their DNA. Like, grow things that are in your DNA. If, if you know, like, those cucumbers that's not in your DNA, don't grow that. Like, grow the things that your mama, your grandmama, your grandmama mama was growing. Do that. Because it, there's a history, there's a story attached to that. And so, um, I don't have that story. Uh, even when I talk to my grandmother, there's a lot of information that's missing. Uh, and so I, I'm piecing things together uh, as I dream about owning property one day and farming. Um, and so although I have missing pieces, I know that once I start farming again, uh, I want to be able to add my own identity to those pieces. So that way my children and my children's children can know where they come from that there is a connection to the land that is uh, very evident and extreme. More questions? Oh, hello. She had the mic. Let her go real quick. All right. Stand up. All right. Hi. Greetings, everyone. I am Ivory. Um, I am an environmental educator. Um, non formal educator, primarily with like after school programs and summer camps. And so, this question is for the educator that's on the panel. Do you have any advice on um, like age appropriateness about trauma topics? So, hey, we live in a food desert. Um, how much did your lunch cost last night? Or, like, <laughs> I don't know, just like those health issues or even like. Uh, indigenous culture, like this is what conversation looks like. This is what stolen land. Like, like, when is that appropriate? When is like, I don't like the touchy subject. Huh? People are like, no, no, high school. What do y'all think? So there's never, children are resilient, and they are brave, and they're courageous, and I, they are not to be underestimated. So I say that to say that there isn't many top, there isn't any topics I can think of. Of course you're going to have it in setting up. You're going to create, you know, <laughs> you're going to have it to be reflective of their age, but, but as far as talking about those things, that is absolutely the age in which you want them to be engaged in those conversations especially with an adult who's able to give them the tools to be able to dissect it and to be able to have a way to be solution-oriented. So that's one of the things I encourage students to do, to not be afraid of history, to be able to face it, to be solution-oriented, to be able to understand that if these were the things that you were tasked with, how would you respond, um, creating those opportunities for um, engagement, um, as 
as far as within their own peers and how they want to change the world in small ways, especially with after school programs. It's a great opportunity to be able to do projects where they can change the community around them. Um, also, of course, this always promotes higher order thinking and also those critical thinking skills with those informational texts and information. That is something that we completely push and it's really important for students to be able to think outside the box. Good. Um, one of the things I wanted to share with you, um, teachers of many and homeschool mother of three, um, it's good to teach them about what has happened, but this is my opinion that I'm sharing with you, where they're not victims, don't have a narrative where they always victim. We don't need another generation growing up thinking they're victims and thinking of sub they're subservient. So solution driven. We teach and then solutions on how they can be more empowered and how they are leaders. Um, so it always got to be a positive spin. We got we teach the history, but you got to add the positive. We do not need another generation of yeah this this victimization stuff because we are very powerful. Mm -hmm. I want to back up with the ES and just add one thing because I'm a science nerd. I taught high school science, public school, 17 years, um, and there's some really interesting research. David Sobel and company on called Ecophobia, the, the popular science version. But it was fascinating to me because it was a longitudinal study of what happens when children are exposed to environmental catastrophe information at various ages. Um, five years old, seven year old, nine years old. And there was actually a negative correlation between exposure to that information and positive environmental behaviors in adulthood and less, meaning like you learn about that stuff and you actually do worse things for the earth. That's what a negative correlation. Um, unless two things were in place. One is an opportunity to fall in love with the earth. And two, an opportunity to see that what you can do makes a positive difference. So even that stuff, right, that we think of as sort of like, I don't know, drop in the bucket or like gloss over activism, like helping baby turtles get to the ocean or like picking up trash, that kind of stuff is actually essential for children's um, social justice identity development. Quick story, my son, when he was eight years old, Loved Legos, totally obsessed with Legos, bought all the kids, and like disappeared in his room. And then he found out that Lego had a, um, a corporate deal with Shell Oil Company. And my son likes the earth. So he was pretty devastated, it's like a moral crisis, and decided to write a handwritten letter to the CEO of um, Lego asking him to get divorced with Shell. It just so happened that Greenpeace was doing a major campaign at the same time. So my son sends a letter, and like a week later, it's all over the news that like Lego divorced Shell. And he's like, I <laughs> so children need that along with the information, right? They need the victory. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Emmanuel Basknight. Originally from Elizabeth City, North Carolina, so like east side of the state. Um, but right now I'm living in uh, Chicago. So um, I am not a farmer, did not grow up in this. Um, my journey to this has been spirit-led. Um, one night, my great aunt came to me in a dream, and she said, child, sit down, I'll tell you where your farm is going to be. Um, um, so that was about three years ago, since then, I walked away from my 15-year uh, career in advertising and marketing, and I just been focused on this journey. So I'm just like, kind of nosy, want to know, if you can share any uh, spiritual lessons that you've learned um, through your work. It all started from spiritual lessons. I'm telling you. I mean, I grew up in the Catholic Church and I have much respect for what I learned there. Um, but I didn't feel like that was right for me. I felt like there was a lot of missing elements. Um, and originally, eventually came back to it in my own way. You know, I have all these markings on me to remember. Um, but I found a lot of, in my time that I, that I stepped away, I found a lot of correlations between African cultures and Indian cultures and Asian cultures and uh, a lot of our spiritual beliefs are very similar and often there's a lot of stories that of avatars and deities and things like that that correlate. Um, and, and understanding those things aside um, really reshaped everything for me. I mean. One of the biggest things was, I mean, like, 
a lot of people don't tend to talk about it at conferences, but it was plant medicines. And it, it came to me um, because I was raised by my grandparents when I was a little boy. My mom was an AT, and when I was born, so I had to stay with my grandparents. And I was really close to them, and they were really old. They were really old when my mom was born. And um, my grandmother passed when I was young. So, the re I mean, that's the reason I brought it up, that they're old, because like they were already getting almost ready to pass when I was born. And my grandmother passed when I was really young, so I was really close to my grandfather, because I felt like she had left me, you know? And um, when I was 12 years old, I helped my grandfather pass, and it was really, really hard for me, and it was really painful for him. He had cancer, and it was hard, and it was one of the worst things I ever went through, and it really reshaped me. And um, when I was like 15 years old, I mean, I'd grown up doing the D.A.R.E. program, like I did the big speech for D.A.R.E. in fifth grade for like the whole school board and everything or whatever. And I was like, yeah, drugs are bad, they'll kill you and all this stuff. And I would see my friends like using cannabis and things like that and they'd be okay and they'd be getting good grades in school and like all this kind of stuff. So I looked it up on the internet, I'm like, what will this do to me? And I found out that there was people utilizing these medicines to help with cancer. And I was like, what? Like my grandfather was hurt so bad and there's this plant that could help him ease his pain and everything happened then. Like, I didn't care about any of this, but like when that happened, I felt like everything I knew was wrong, I felt like everything was a lie, and I spent a week having incredible revelations about the world. Like, I realized that I was an organism, <laughs> like that's something I never thought of. I saw trees for the first time. I'm like, oh, that's not just something I drive by, like that's a thing, like that's a living thing. Um, you know, it's wild, you know? I'm like 17 years old realizing that like leaves fall on the ground and turn into soil. And I'm just like, how did I not know this my whole life, you know? And those are the spiritual revelations. And like, those are things that like, even before the plant medicine that I started to become aware of. But I really feel like, I feel as though it might not be the root for everybody, but I do feel like reconnecting with plant medicines, especially the ones that come from where we come from, are very beneficial to um, enlightening us and uh, uh, bringing us closer to nature and especially for those people like myself that grew up in cities completely disconnected from everything and all you know is a screen. It's really important medicine or even to work with people that have had those experiences to help guide you into a more spiritual and holistic view of the world. that I'm loved, um, that I can love myself, uh, that I don't have to be burdened by fear or anxiety. Um, I know the biggest one for me was um, farming with community. And I was like, yeah, I wanna go to this farm and I wanna uh, be a part of community. You know, all my life I was searching for community because uh, I really felt like I didn't fit in anywhere. Um, and so I was like, yeah, it's gonna be with Christians and you know, it's gonna be fun, we're gonna talk about Jesus and farming, yeah. And then, like, I leave there just broken, miserable, uh, even more faithless than I started. Um, but I feel like God used that as an opportunity to show me a lot about myself. Um, there are some things that, uh, through the act of farming, that uh, you're going to realize that, wow, that's a flaw of mine. Ah, oh, man, I'm really not good at that. Ah, uh, I know what my tendencies are. Uh, what my affinities are towards um, self-harm uh, was one thing that uh, allowed for me to really find humility, uh, to find peace with myself. Because uh, I, I was at conflict with myself the entire time, and I thought it was just with people. But in reality for me, it was really just me battling myself, and what was a product of that was me um, projecting uh, my fears and insecurities on other people. Um, so yeah. If you go into farming, which I know you are, 
Um, it's going to prune a lot of things out of you. Uh, and you either have to accept who you are and want to improve and change and grow, or don't. You know, I am not a proponent of good vibes only. I think that, you know, there are some bad vibes. Like, you need to go through some, like, seasons that are really, let me not cuss. Um, crappy, yes, crappy, yes. Horse poop, pink the new word, yes, those things. Um, but just through that, uh, enjoy the process. One thing that uh, I really struggled with was I like doing something and only doing it once. Uh, and I felt that God was trying to show me that, no, this is a continual thing. Like you have to keep doing this day in and day out, like being on your mind. Uh, and so me really saying like, okay, okay, I hate this. I really hate this because it, it's, it's, it's bringing these things out of me that are ugly, that I don't like that I don't want to really talk about, things that uh, I'd rather um, ignore, uh, but being able to kind of just say, you know what, that's a part of me. I want to heal that part of me, that part of me that's broken, that was abused, uh, that's experienced trauma. I want to be able to have that part healed. Uh, and so as you go in your farming endeavor, allow yourself to be healed through that process. No matter the uh, insecurities where you're like, I don't think I can do this anymore. I, I'm not good enough, I don't know enough. Those are just excuses. Those are just lies, right? How many, how many of you here started farming knowing everything about farming? Raise your hand. <laughs> how many of you start farming completely or almost completely clueless? Oh yeah, look at that, look at that. This is your family right here. You are not alone, and I wanna make that extremely clear. Uh, no one is perfect here. Uh, we all make mistakes, and you can learn from that. Uh, but draw them into community. Don't get sucked up or isolated by farming. Um, I've seen too many people uh, do that, and they lose their farms. Uh, do that, and they lose their families. Um, and so be missional. Be focused on community. Take care of yourself. You are not the farm. Right? The farm is an extension of you, right? Make that psychological distinction between you and yourself, right? Or your, the farm and you, okay? And if you do that, I promise you, you will enjoy farming way more than you ever had. Make time for yourself. If you like, you know, take care of like many pennies, if that's your thing, like go do that, you know? If, like golfing's your thing, go do that. <laughs> Whatever your thing is, do that. Make time for it. Don't let the farm absorb all of who you are. That makes sense? Cool. Yeah. All right, we'll shut down. <laughs> I to add. Oh, I wanted to add. You said you're great on. Yeah. All right. One of the things that will happen is they will tell you it is nonsense, and they meaning some of our ad professionals and stuff like that. So don't negate your ancestors. Keep them with you, and then your farming will be easy because you will have that help. Yeah. You know, unseen help. So please, if that one ancestor brought you, you got a bit more. Because in the universities, 
to get a liberal de degree, you need to do a bunch of silly things. And some important things, but the idea is that we have a general idea of what's going on in the world. And one of them is just world religion, which I think is pretty cool. But I think with understanding how important um, food from our land is, that this should also be part of our liberal, liberal education. So I guess as educators or just people who are in there, do you guys are hearing this or do you think that we can actually include that in our movement to get that part of the general education for us university college people? <laughs> okay, I haven't really talked yet, so it seems like the most appropriate question. <laughs> um, I, I'm one for uh, thinking in terms of sovereignty, and so like any kind of institutionalized injection of this kind of indigenous or in a multi-generational kind of knowledge doesn't seem quite useful to me. I mean, it might be great as introductory type of materials in universities, but when it comes down to it, like I was in Pennsylvania farming and we it was outside of State College, I mean, Penn State uh, University, and it's a big ag school, and um, some of the students would come and, you know, come to like kind of intern or volunteer, or whatever it might be, and they're ag students. I've never went to school for agriculture. Um, and they are a little bit, like, I mean, it's a little bit harsh, but useless. And, 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 then, <laughs> and, and that's not like a blank statement, of course. I'm sure there's plenty you have that kind of hands and kind of heart kind of skill that's needed to really kind of pull off that work that goes on, like that kind of interchange that goes on with nature in order to like kind of produce um, that sustenance that's the goal. And so, I mean, to me, and, and I'm sure other people have different opinions, but um, it doesn't quite make full sense to try to like encapsulate all of it into a kind of university type educational system. Uh, so, I go to North Carolina a and I graduate uh, this spring, so I'm um, super excited about that. Uh, college sucks. I hate college. Um, <laughs> I literally I took a break from college to actually farm because I was like, being in an animal science program was teaching me to work for Tyson, Smithville, Pilgrims, and it didn't resonate with my uh, childhood love of nature. Uh, being out and playing with bugs, playing with dirt. I was doing that while I was in high school, playing with bugs and dirt. Like, I was a weirdo. Still am a weirdo. Um, and just seeing how, like, that didn't resonate with me. And so taking time out, farming, coming back, and realizing, wow, I'm not learning anymore because I've learned that while farming. Um, I think what's important is understanding that even at a land-grant institution, um, a lot of students don't realize uh, how important agriculture is. Um, I know at a and a lot of students come in and in our ag program, um, we'll kind of introduce them to, you know, we'll bring out the big piglets, not the big pigs, they'll probably eat them. Uh, the piglets, uh, we'll bring out some chickens, um, and people are like, we have a farm? What? It's like, oh my god, I didn't know we had farms. What? You know, and so it's it's amazing because like it's we're called Aggies, right? Aggies, right? That's agriculture, but no one's making that connection. And so I do think that um, the university system should take more pride in agriculture, especially if they stem from a uh, agricultural background. Um, I know NC State, you know, yeah, NC State will go. Um, you know, they do a pretty good job. I know A&T can grow a little bit more than that. Um, they like to, you know, talk about engineering, engineering, engineering. Look at their engineers. I'm like, yay, engineering, but what, what about what about the Aggie Aggies? Um, so yeah, I think in terms of making curriculum out of it, uh, for like gen eds, I'm assuming that's what you're talking about, right? 
Okay. Um, I think that would be cool. I think the issue might be um, if there's not any kind of engagement or marketing, so to speak, around that class um, to create interest, it might not get a lot of traction or you, you might just be getting people who are already ad focused. Um, so I think that's a big thing is making sure that there's more uh, traction and visibility within the school system of why agriculture is important and how they play a role in that. Hey, so I, okay, so a couple things. It all depends on how your particular institution is set up, okay? So if you're looking at having this be a general ed um, curriculum course, I think there's possibly two tracks you can take. One, if you want to take it on an institutional level, it would be nice to have and kind of talk to those, um, specifically your dean. Um, and you would want to definitely make sure that they, you can prove that it is an interest. So maybe getting on a survey, um, doing those kind of things to show that that is a, a major shift. In, because a lot of times they are interested in um, having different types of um, programs throughout the, um, you know, throughout whatever semester, right? Um, especially if there is a department that's already established. So be, just having that conversation, and then actually having a conversation, hey, what steps do we take as an institution to have different types of curriculum come through, or different kind of classes, um, and just be familiar with your particular institution's policy surrounding those classes, of course, because a lot of time that's in relation to staffing, and also just your general population. Um, every institution has a specific target population that they take with you, so you just want to just have a conversation. Um, if you don't have a conversation, you probably won't Right? So that's one thing. Also, another way that you can take it if you want to have more ownership of that is looking to uh, forming student organizations. Uh, most colleges and institutions are supportive of that. And again, that is a, uh, just a conversation that you'll have as well with that particular department within your institution. Um, but just figure out um, and, you know, that nice little packet they give you about how you form student organizations, all the student organizations that exist on campus. There may already be one that exists, but you also, as a leader, I can see that you are one, can definitely go through and um, create one on your own. And again, that would be you being able to, with collective and like-minded individuals, form something. And so a lot of times institutions are reflective of those interest groups as well to help them establish things that they can also start to discuss and teach on as well. So those are two possible tracks, and again, that would just be tailored to your specific location. I hope that feels helpful. I got one. I got one. Small business centers at community colleges are very, you know, they're very encouraging to young entrepreneurs in the area. Uh, like myself, we have a farmers market on the actual campus, and things like that. Uh, except CSAs through there, through um, the college as well. I always say that uh, Black History on a program for like agriculture and farming. So my area, they're pretty, they're pretty uh, accepting, accepting, and you know, working with young farmers. I also want to say. Create the education yourself. Be an adjunct professor. No. Be, <laughs> you don't have to be an adjunct professor. But you can be an educator, right? We're all we all have some information in here that someone else don't know. We're all teaching each other, and we're all a part of community. So one thing actually talking about this right now kind of put a little chill on my back because years ago when I was studying in college I always said that one day I'm going to be writing my own history that's what I said and I think that everybody up here what we're doing is writing our history right her history right a, a, the story right and so realizing that you don't need someone else to do it for you. Because we are in the time when the knowledge is out there and all you have to do is seek it. Cherokee Indian seed saver. 
And so we'll have an event on March 20th, and there's a great video um, about him and his seed saving. And so and, and that those seeds are available to everybody publicly. So I encourage you to look at the <laughs> about 8 30 right now 8 21 okay is there any final question out there burning inside and just have to ask all right all right so i want to thank you for coming to the conference thank every single body that made it this far um, we'll be sending a digital workshop evaluation to get your opinion on this event to your email address that you registered with for today Please, if you can, fill it out. It would be greatly appreciated. Leah will be available, yes, as late as it is. She will still be available for book signing and sales until about 9 p.m. So please meet her outside in the lobby if you'd like to purchase a copy of her book. Also, please visit our exhibitors. One of them are mine out there. We're trying to get cleaned up by 10, so please wrap up with whatever you need to do in the space by let's say 9 15. Um, also hope to see you during the weekend conference like I said tomorrow and Sunday in Mars Hill some of the panelists you saw tonight will be presenting including me so thank you so much